Last but not least, Panos and Andrea Nessis from uh, um, Parimin uh, PSL will talk about computing convex hull prices, which are the yeah, which are the prices that uh, Nicola advocated in favor of. Um, Panos, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Anthony. Just to come back with Ephthemis, he's out. He's out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he'll he'll miss like an answer to uh, the example that Nicola presented. So that example is a little bit contrived because the demand is low, right? And you have a very large unit, I mean, to satisfy it is lower. So that is not an issue of convex hull pricing or not. I mean, like this is a large unit and uh, cheap, but large unit. And even with marginal pricing, that would be you know, an issue. Why, why is that unit in place in any case, right? Of course, demand is not going to be low because if demand is that low, then that unit would never produce. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not efficient. Okay, so let's move to uh, computational issues and uh, how do we compute convex hull prices? And I guess by now you are convinced uh, by Nicola that that's the best pricing schema that exists. Um, so very, very briefly, um, pricing uh, in markets with non-convex is, uh, is, is a long issue that has been revived by electricity markets um, because of the unit commitment problem. Commitment costs and the indivisibilities uh, that uh, refer to technical minimum constraints, etc. Uh, they create this issue that there may be no market clearing prices. So we say that the market clears, right? The, but uh, essentially, the market does not clear because the prices that we get are not adequate to support uh, the market schedules. Uh, in uh, in the sense that, given these prices. Uh, some market participants who would have an incentive to do something different. So with marginal cost pricing, we also have that even if you bid truthfully, you bid your exact cost, you may lose, you may lose money. And the way that we've been dealing with, with is with make whole payments. Make whole payments, as, as was explained, is not, is not the same with lost opportunity costs. Um, there have been several approaches to, to deal with the issue and um, the literature was there's a long literature of different pricing schemes. Some keep marginal cost prices, they try to provide or they provide side payments or they inflate the prices or they even eliminate um, uh, side payments to, to, to solve uh, the issue and that that has been something that we we discussed in Atlanta uh, six years ago. It was it was I think Sakis was at the audience at at, at the time. Um, but uh, the the um, this presentation is about convex hull pricing, which has been considered as an ideal solution to solve uh, the problem. And let's let's see let's see why and how this. Uh, can be supported by the method that we also use to, to compute the, the prices. So I'll start with the unit commitment problem where we have, where we minimize uh, the cost. So F of X and Y is the cost function of a generation unit. X are the continuous variables and Y are the discrete variables, so the on-off uh, decisions. Uh, subject to satisfying the demand, we have some linear constraints, the power balance, but you can add also reserve constraints, transmission constraints, all the linear constraints that are system constraints, and the generation unit constraints. So X and Ys uh, should be feasible. ZI is a set of constraints that, that refer to each generation unit. And one way to compute uh, convex hull prices is by formulating the Lagrangian dual. Essentially, we dualize uh, the system constraints. We take the dual function, so we minimize the Lagrangian, and then we maximize over lambda the dual function. So if we solve this problem, then the lambdas that we derive are the convex hull prices. So that is one, one way to do it. 
Another way was to consider a, what we call a convexified primal. So in the objective function, instead of taking the, the objective, the cost, we get, take the, the convex envelope of the cost functions. And instead of taking the constraints of the units, say the mixed integer linear uh, representation of the, of the unit constraints that we are mostly familiar with, we take the convex hull of these constraints. So if we solve this convexified primal and we derive the dual of the system constraints, then we get the convex hull prices. So these are two equivalent uh, ways to compute. Okay, in a parenthesis, just to relate what, what we do today uh, with marginal cost pricing, uh, what we do today is that we fix the binary decisions and then we get NLP and we get the dual variables from the system constraints that's the marginal cost prices this is, these are the prices that are not market clearing we need to make whole payments and in fact in some markets we have started also relaxing some of the binary variables especially for some fast start units for a small subset of units uh, relaxing these uh, binary variables and getting what we call like extended LMPs, extended location of marginal prices. So that's a proxy, but for a very limited set of, of units that uh, is, is used also in the, in the US, partly because uh, they could not compute convex hull prices uh, exactly up to now. Okay, so um, let me remind what is the key property of convex hull pricing. And I can read from the slide that convex hull prices support an arbitrary market solution with minimum uplift. And this uplift equals the duality gap between the market primal solution and the optimal solution of the Lagrangian dual. So what does it mean? Let's try to decode, I mean, like this property. Uh, what do we mean by supporting the market solution? We mean that we need to make the market participant indifferent between two options. One is to follow the market schedule, so participating in the market and accepting the schedule that is derived from the, from, from the market solution. And the second option is to self-schedule. And this is a, an option that is on the table in, in, in US markets. Uh, generators may not bid in the day ahead market, but they can declare their commitment and, uh, and schedules for the next day. And the ISO needs to accept them as is which is, as we know, inefficient and makes markets thin. So if we want to support a market solution, the market participants should be made indifferent. How do we make it? How do we make uh, the participant indifferent? Okay, if we define the profit, which is uh, the revenues that he gets from the market minus the cost, then we have the pro profit given the market schedule, the X and Ys that the market decides, and the optimal profit given the market price. So suppose, I mean, that you knew the market price and you could self-schedule, you would maximize your profit, you would get the optimal profit. <laughs> we need some uplift. So we need some side payments to, to compensate for lost opportunity cost to cover for the difference. When, the, when there is a difference between the optimal profit and the, and the profit from the market, if we compensate for the difference, for, for this difference, then the participant is indifferent between the two, the two options. And, and the beauty of convex hull pricing is that it does this by uh, minimizing the uplift. Essentially by proving that the, the minimum uplift equals the duality gap, the solution of the Lagrangian dual and the solution of the scheduling of the MILP uh, problem. And the interesting thing is that uh, this holds for any solution. So suppose, I mean, that the market operator selects a suboptimal solution or some solutions that are within epsilon from the optimal solution. The prices will not change. All that is going to change is the uplift to pay for the loss opportunity cost, and this will be exactly the amount of the suboptimality. So, so that's a, a, very, a very attractive uh, property. Okay. Any, any questions so far on the... Preliminaries, please feel free to, to, to ask 
uh, during the presentation. Don't wait till the end. Um, well, main approaches. Why was it? Let's say why was it difficult to solve? Uh, first approaches was to uh, solve the Lagrangian dual using basically subgradient methods, and then the convexified primal uh, using what we was called as uh, extended formulations. Let's see what's the history. So the early approaches were, were tried by, by an ISO, my, MISO in the US, uh, but subgradient methods, it was not a surprise, they faced convergence difficulties. Then they started introducing very customized algorithms and complicated algorithms to solve these uh, difficulties. And that was not very, very, very attractive. So the, the project uh, was uh, out of budget and the effort was, was abandoned. And the, the question still remained, would all these uh, approaches always work? So people and several research teams um, started considering uh, to characterize the convex envelope of the objective function and the convex hull of the constraint sets. So that is a difficult problem. Uh, some will, will say doomed also. Uh, the problem is that they yield uh, approximate prices. So it's not easy to, to, to derive the convex hull of the constraints. Uh, for long, and uh, there have been problematic constraints. So there are papers that say, OK, this would work if there are no ramping constraints. But there are ramping constraints, and there are even more complicating constraints. They started resulting in linear programs that were not were not practical to solve, and all this was depending on a case by case uh, formulation of the of the constraints. So you would have a set of constraints, and then you would have to find another set of constraints to characterize the convex hull, if possible. Uh, of course, that was that 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 was not easy to implement and. Uh, Imagine it would not generalize. Imagine that we have a new unit with new constraints, and we would have to come up with different formulations to, to define prices. That 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 was not very attractive. Uh, and uh, last but but not least, all these efforts create created some confusion on the properties of convex hull prices, because they were starting solving like a convex relaxation of the. Uh, of the unit commitment problem, and the solution was was not was not meaningful. Uh, there was a question: Okay, how is it a marginal pricing? What what do we what do we what are the actually the prices that we derive from this? And there is, these schedules do not make sense; they are not feasible, etc. So let's uh, see the the key idea. So how we approached uh, the problem that's that's joint work with with uh, Michael Karamanis, Dimitri Bertsimas and, and Bill Hogan as part of the RPAE project that that uh, Michael described yesterday. So the key idea came from uh, what we call generalized linear programming or dancing wolf decomposition or column generation. And, and the property that uh, that uh, dancing wolf decomposition essentially solves the Lagrangian dual, and equivalently a convexified primal. So the motivation was was work done on cruise scheduling problems, uh, and the integer programming community. And we have people from UC Leuven and Georgia Tech that have the authorities in integer programming. Um, and in in that community, they. They know that generalized linear programming in self sense solves solves the dual. So it it is knowledge I mean that exists in a several class of problems, but uh, somehow this has not been uh, noticed, uh, and and the connection between the these approaches and the the economic interpretation was not really uh, was not noticed uh, till till recently. Let's see so the, the method uh, and start from the unit commitment problem and I'll present you a different formulation of the unit commitment problem that you might have not uh, thought about because we are we tend to be fixed that uh, unit commitment problem is a mixed integer linear programming problem 
and, and we solve it with Cplex now with Gurobi, which is more popular. Um, so imagine that we have the X and Ys, uh, the, the continuous and discrete variables, and we map the X and Ys as a feasible schedule to a binary variable. So this Z I N is an nth feasible schedule of unit I. So X and Ys are now parameters and they map to a binary variable. And its schedule of cost has a cost, which is C I N hat. Uh, so hats are parameters now. And a way to describe the unit commitment problem is among all feasible schedules for all units, select one schedule for each unit such that the system constraints are satisfied at minimum cost. So I start from, from, from the bottom and we see that we have all, let's say that we can generate all feasible schedules and we do not have to assume any finite schedules here. There are no strict assumptions on, on, on this formulation. If you are not convinced, imagine that since I say that it is you can have all schedules, you have the optimal schedule, you plug it in, it's an integer programming problem, very large, but, but let's see, uh, let, that's, let's leave this out how we solve it. So this is an equi equivalent formulation of the unit commitment problem as an integer programming problem. And do we need to solve this problem? Well, no, we don't need to solve this integer programming problem. We only need to solve the relaxation of this problem. So we relax the binary variable in this formulation and then it is pretty straightforward to, to show that the LP relaxation of this formulation essentially computes exactly the convex hull prices. So we have a convexified primal where the, there is a convexity constraint, the sum of all feasible schedules equals to one. That's, that's a typical convexity constraint, how we define convexity. And the dual variables that we get from the system constraints are exactly the convex hull prices. So then how do we solve this relaxation now? Well, the first thing is with a simple, as Anthony says, vanilla column generation. So that's, a, that's how we solve all, all scheduling problems in, in integer programming. We solve the relaxation and then we do branch and price. Here we only need to solve the relaxation. So we start with, with what we call a restricted master problem. Uh, imagine that we can plug in the MILP solution. We can solve the MILP unit commitment problem and uh, start from that solution or start, start from no solution with just with slack variables. Uh, so we start somehow, it doesn't matter where we start and we get, we solve a, a linear programming problem and we get these two uh, dual uh, variables. Uh, using the dual information, we then solve subproblems for each unit, and we'll, we'll see uh, the interpretation of these subproblems that minimize the reduced cost. So, for each unit, we can solve in parallel uh, a subproblem. If we find a negative reduced cost, then we add these schedules into the, into the restricted master problem. We compute new duals and we iterate until we converge. So, that's that's basically the method. And the good news here is that we can treat the constraints of the generation units as is. Uh, you can see that the sub problems X and Y's are in Z. This is the formulation of the unit commitment problem as is. We don't have to make any assumptions. The only assumptions that, assumption that we need is that these feasible sets are bounded which is always true because it's a physical problem. And the good news is that because we have a MILP representation, we can also have a finite convergence of the algorithm. The algorithm will converge to the exact whole convex hull prices, and it can give us also bounds. So if we terminate early, we have a bound on the uplifts. Of course, it can parallelize. We can parallelize because we can solve uh, the subproblems in, in parallel and it's highly generalizable why because if we have a new unit new constraints we can plug in without having to think about computing convex hull of the constraints etc 
So you can use the straightforward the formulation of the unit computer problem. And what is also very interesting that is that we have an economic interpretation of, of the method. And we start with a subproblem, which is an easy, uh, easy, easy to notice that it's a profit maximization problem, uh, considering that the unit self schedules under, under the price that we derive, the lambdas that we derive at each iteration. So when we solve a subproblem, it is actually as a unit calculating uh, the schedule that maximizes uh, its profit. Uh, if if it's if it's scheduled under the, the prices at, the, at that iteration, so the lambdas are uh, essentially the tentative prices at, the, at each iteration, and the and the uh, p's here are the tentative profit at each iteration. And a negative reduced cost would mean that a unit could have a profit from self scheduling which would be higher than the tentative profit that it could receive from the market. So when we ask the question, do we have a negative reduced cost? If the answer is yes, it means that the unit can do better by self-scheduling. So we have not converged. When we converge, then the, the answer is no. It means that no unit can do better by self-scheduling. That's how we support uh, the market solution. Um, we can... We have time, Anthony, to see the mechanics. Uh, we have until quarter to five. Okay. Yeah, okay. Fifteen minutes. Okay. So that's very briefly to, to, to show you like the, the mechanics. We have like here a sim very simple problem with uh, two units, uh, A and, uh, and, and B, that satisfy demand that is 35 and uh, Unit A can be scheduled between 10 and 50. Unit B is a, uh, a, has a, is a zero or 50 uh, unit as a block. Um, so we start with, uh, so we can start uh, with uh, some uh, schedules and the slack variables. We solve the restricting master problem. We calculate these duals. Using these duals, we solve the subproblems, essentially comparing the tentative uh, profit with the profit with the optimal profit, finding uh, negative reduced cost schedules, adding them into the master problem, and and iterating until until we converge to the to the minimum uplift. Um, so I'll I'll skip the the details, uh, just to show you an. Uh, unless we have any question on this. Um, just to show you like what we mean by extended formulation. So we, with a picture, that's a unit commitment problem for a unit, for, for an example with two generators and three hours and RAM constraints, the extended formulation would be like what we see on the right. It starts, it starts growing. Um, an example of uh, in that example, actually, uh, here is the minimum duality gap. You can see the, the dual function and the MILP solution. Uh, the maximizer of the dual function is where we derive like the convex hull prices. If we select uh, marginal uh, prices or uh, an integer relaxation or average incremental cost, other approaches, this, this uh, gap is, is larger. Uh, does, does it converge in practical examples? The answer is yes, in a reasonable amount of iteration, like tens of iterations. Um, for a FERC PJM-like data set, about a thousand generators, 24 hours, 10 block offers, uh, we can see that uh, we start from the MILP solution here and we observe all the typical things that we that we anticipate in, in column generation, this plateau, and then reducing, and then some tail off uh, effect. But it's here we converge like in 37 iterations. If we start from no solution, just with slack variables, which means that we could solve the pricing problem in parallel with the scheduling problem. We don't have to solve the scheduling problem first, and then the and then the pricing problem. 
we converge in 55 iterations. Um, some other, maybe, and how many columns, how many schedules do we need? Uh, tens of thousands. Uh, that's the order for a thousand uh, units. So the size of the problem does not does not grow too too, too much. Um, some different, yeah, I can I can skip this with the ramp limits. The method gives us bounds. So here we see uh, the upper and the lower bound on the uplift. So when we uh, when we are close to convergence, we have a, an upper and a lower bound on the amount of the uplift. So if we terminate early, we know that we, we know how, how what's the worst case for 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 the uplift. Um, it seems that close to convergence, also the duals are converging. We do not we do not see uh, oscillations in the duals in the in the last uh, iterations. And without doing anything to, to to speed up, like stabilization and other methods to, to speed up, like the uh, we haven't done anything here. When we include transmission constraints, iterations of course increase uh, for uh, for uh, a, uh, a data set with seventy two thermal generators, seventy nodes, one hundred twenty lines, still twenty four hours. We are in the hundred of it, one hundred iterations. And also show you like in a, in a real ISO in a Southwest power pool data set here's without transmission constraints, but a problem with 700 uh, resources, 24 hours and all the reserve uh, problems close to 100 iterations with transmission constraints that goes like to around 200. So evidence is, is that it is it, we, yes, we can solve these problems in, in, in reasonable time and and we can also think about speeding up uh, in, in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions. And thank you, Panos, for the super interesting presentation for leaving some time for uh, uh, questions. questions. Um, maybe I can set one in the uh, few slides ago. The warm start is taking the optimal solution as an original column, or yes, okay, yes. The warm start is is using the MILP solution, and and what we observe is that we if we start from a feasible solution, then we need to accumulate quite a few uh, schedules like. Uh, uh, 10,000 schedules until we until the objective function starts to 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 drop, in order to be able to combine to combine many many schedules in, and and be able to drop there. This is a, this is a typical plateau effect. I mean, like of of column generation. And maybe a broader question, also in relation to our discussion yesterday. So when we met with Nestero of uh, a few years ago in your master thesis in the office, I think the only thing he asked us was, what is the dimension of your dual space? And somehow he like went like a missile to the level method. Mm. So I'm a bit wondering if there is like, uh, so Yuri has worked on complex results, but for the practitioner, is there like a roadmap of should I choose just subgradient method, the cutting plane like Kelly level, mm. column generation bundle? I'm wondering if there is like something beyond dimensionality of the of the problem that is a useful guideline for practical implementation. Yeah. Okay. Very very interesting question and long one. I think uh, it had, I think it has a long answer, but. For column generation, the answer is that I can relate to, to simplex that has like the worst case, you know, complexity. It's, it's, uh, it's not very encouraging, but still works in linear programming. And that also carries over to generalized uh, linear programming. Uh, but what we see in practice is that we need, we do not need thousands of iterations to, to converge as opposed to subgradient methods, which 
which I think it's not it's not the best way to to approach these uh, type of problems. So column generation or Kelly's algorithm, I mean, like they are uh, equivalent uh, uh, methods, but with different implementation in the primal and the dual. I think what is what makes this approach attractive is that uh, we do not need to change the formulations of the problem. So essentially, we 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 can still we can work with the native formulations of the unit commitment problem uh, and um, and use the modeling of the constraints of the units as is solve sub problems that are already modeled like in today's system we have like the costs uh, all we need to, is to add like a few linear terms in the objective function keep the primal formulation of the unit commitment in terms of the system constraints in the formulation in the existing formulation not having to change anything of that and the the only uh, the only modeling and that we need to do is or implementation is to 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 implement the iteration of deriving feasible schedules and adding them to the master problem so that's the the benefit that we see in terms of implementation that makes this uh, attractive without without doing any other fancy stuff that we, that you can do and and, and speed up things um, and uh, and yeah and also the economic interpretation i think that was very very attractive to be able to to understand how exactly the convex hull supports the solution and that convex hull pricing is is essentially a marginal cost pricing in a convexified problem in a convexified economy uh, it it is derived by by a convex combination of feasible schedules and that is why it supports any schedule because it because we we take the the convex hull essentially right we shape the convex hull by this convex constraint we can support any schedule that the iso can select at a minimum cost and and that is very very obvious and from from this formulation of the unit commitment problem that is not really a typical formulation that one would is is used to see in power systems yeah any other questions With that, I will thank everyone for their perseverance to the end of the workshop. You were rewarded by wine. Thanks also to all the speakers and the panelists. Very grateful for your time and energy. And uh, see you in, in the wine and cheese. <laughs>